morning. How's everybody doing today? Man, look at all those summer shirts. They've got their summer gear on, trying to stay cool. Officially summertime. Uh, right on cue there, Mr. Swanberg. Thank you. It's a very nice shirt. Hey, we're glad everybody is here today. Glad everybody came to worship with us today. If it's your first time here, we just want to say welcome. Welcome to Parkway. We talk a lot about connecting people to Christ, and we hope that that is what you find today, just an atmosphere where you have that opportunity to connect, to connect with Christ. We don't force anybody to do that because that's not what the gospel is all about, but uh, we're, we want to just create that atmosphere for you to have an opportunity to connect with the King of Kings today. So to help us do that is going to be the worship team. They're going to come on up front, and then also we have um, some, some individuals that are part of the prayer team. And they're going to come down front here, um, and I'm not sure if we have anybody in the balcony or not. Mr. Kreis is right back there, so if you're in the balcony and you would like prayer, Randy's going to be right there, and then some other folks here. We have them come down front just so you can identify who, they're, who they are, and they're going to be standing here in the aisles. And, you know, I think Pastor Dennis is, is the one that I heard it from, but, you know, he talks about giving your problems a ride to church doesn't really do you any good, does it? Because when you leave, you give your problems a ride back home. So we don't want to be people who give our problems a ride to church, and then, you know, after church is done, we take our problems and and go back home. We want to take our problems, whatever the stuff is in our life, and we want to pray about those things and help ask God to give us some perspective, ask God to give us some answers, because he has answers for each and every one of our problems in our life. And so these people are going to be at the, at the heads of the aisles. Just want to encourage you during our worship time to, to, uh, to take advantage of that, to come down front, to ask them to pray with you about anything going on in your life. If you're in the balcony, go back to, to Randy back there and ask him just to pray with you about anything going on in your life. So why don't we stand this morning? <laughs> Wait a minute. What was that? Did you guys hear that? Did you hear yourselves? Like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> wow. Everybody okay this morning? <laughs> oh. Shake it out. Shake it out. We're going to stand and we're going to worship. And uh, if there comes a time where you're too tired to stand, we, you can go ahead and sit down. There's no, we don't have any rules. We don't have any standing police walking around making sure that you're standing. We do want to give God our best, though. We do just want to say, God, we are here to worship you. And if you've got stuff going on, come down for prayer. If you don't have stuff going on, we're going to sing. And we're going to celebrate who he is and just thank him for all the blessings in our life. So, God, here we are, your kids. God, and we have gathered in this place. And, Lord, we want to worship you. We want to say thank you. We want to celebrate who you are, God. Lord, for those that that um, don't really feel like they can celebrate because there's a lot of stuff going on. I just pray that they would come down and receive that prayer that they need from you, Lord God. And Lord, we say thank you. We look to you, God, the author and the finisher of our faith. We take our eyes off of our stuff and we look to you, God. Help us to do that today. Help us to not give our problems a ride to church. And, and Lord, help us not to give our pride a ride to church either, God. I pray that we would come to you humbly, exalting your name because you are so worthy in this place. Amen.
sing on and on.
Jesus, precious Jesus. 
to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease just from Jesus simple taking life and rest and joy and sang a song earlier just about 
knowing the heart of God. And I just want to give you part of the heart of God here, a pretty good chunk of the heart of God. And it seems like we often read this portion of Scripture following our worship time, but I think we need to hear it often. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is the heart of God for you. He loves you. And nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. I just want to encourage you and even, even challenge you that are struggling with that this morning. Does God really love me? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I just want you to, I want you to own that this morning. I want you to hear God's heart towards you, that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And he is for you. And Jesus, who sits at his right hand, is for you, interceding for you. So I don't want you to forget that. We, one of the hymns we, we sang talked about grace to trust him more and Jennifer was making the sign for more and it was kind of this all encompassing I saw that out of the corner of my eye this all like oh for grace to trust him more in everything kind of this circular I need to trust him in everything and there's some areas maybe that you're not trusting God because going back to our first thing that we talked about does he really love me I want you to know you can trust him you can trust him that one thing you're kind of maybe holding back, saying, I don't know if I can trust him in this area, whether it's finances, whether it's relationship, whatever it is, I'm telling you, you can trust him because he loves you. And I just hope that you can get your arms out there and say, all right, God, one more. I'm trusting you. I want to encompass my life with trust in you. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. First of all, God, that we would truly know how wide and how deep your love is for us, God. God, that we would truly know that, not just know it in our head, but Lord, know it in our hearts and know it in the way that we live life, God. Know it in the way that we treat others, God. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you more, to trust you more, God. Because you love us, God, we can trust you. You are faithful, Lord. We have proved you over and over, God. I just pray that you'd help us to remember that and to place our lives so freely and completely in your loving, powerful, capable hands. We do that this morning. We thank you, God, for this time that we've had to lift up the name of Jesus Christ because of who you are, Jesus, and everything that you've done for us. We give you praise. Hey, as you find your seat this morning, let's find somebody that looks somewhat unfamiliar to you. Maybe somebody you haven't seen in a while. Tell them hello. Find out their name.
All right, you bunch of friendly people, simmer down. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm excited for this Sunday because this is one of those rare days, one of those rare days in which we have to bring a wagon into the sanctuary because it's BGMC Sunday for us, and uh, I wanted to share with you some information. So we're going to actually start off by calling all the kids down who are in first through fifth grade. Come on down. They are my emergency go-to ushering team. And here they come. They're going to come to the center. Even Rovercomer is going to get in on the act. Hi, Rovercomer. How are you? Good to see you. So if you don't know what's going on, we're going to be taking an offering here for BGMC, Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. And all this money goes on to the mission field to help reach the gospel and spread the gospel around the world for children and our missionaries to do that effectively. So a lot of what you give today is going to buy copy machines. It's going to buy curriculum. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to tell you about something special that's going to happen in Africa coming up this summer that we're going to be partnering with as well that we're pretty excited about. But for now, I would ask, let's go ahead and pray over our offering, and the kids are going to get ready to run out through the zones, okay? Let us pray. Father, we come before you and thank you so much for the opportunity of Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. I thank you for the wonderful things that we have done, Lord God, already. We have uh, just through your grace and the goodness, Father, Lord God, and, and putting on the hearts of, of each family represented to sow seed into this ministry to help so many. To think that since BGMC's inception, there's been well over $68 million that has come in from children uh, in churches all around the nation. I ask that you continue to help us to do more, to do more, Lord God. There, your, your need is so great. Someone once said, how come Jesus hasn't returned yet? And then they went to another country, and then they saw because so many haven't heard about Jesus yet. And his uh, love is tearing with us, Lord. So we need to be quickened about sending that message and reaching the nation. We give you all praise and all glory. Amen. Now, the kids are going to come out to you. And while they're doing that, I'm going to share with you a few statistics. So if I can keep your attention as well. One of the things is here is our goal this year for our kids is $5,000. We are right at the $4,000 threshold mark right now. And we're not even halfway through the year. Is that pretty good? Somebody get excited about that. Because I told a lot of people, remember last year, how much did we miss last year's mission goal by? And kids, you can go ahead and start going out there, go to your sections. We missed it by $3. We came $3 under $3,000. So they were just a little shy, which is good news for me because I didn't have to be subjected to some heinous, uh, uh, embarrassing situation, which I'm so thankful for. But folks, one of the things as well that we're looking at is with our $5,000 goal is in the month of July and August, all the money that comes in for BGMC through the entire state of Oregon, 100% of that money is going to go to a missionary named Phil Malcolm. Phil Malcolm is in Africa, and what we're looking to do is this. For $700, they can build a church, they can train the teacher, and they can get curriculum for children for one whole year. $700 in Africa. So we are looking at July and August. Everything that comes in for us will go to that project from all around the state, as well as kids' summer camps. We take offerings, and in our camp that our kids go to, they receive almost $2,000 in a single offering, and all that money is going to go help Pastor Phil Malcolm in Africa as well. So we're pretty excited about that there. Now, while we've talked about missions, I should give you an update. We are missing some children today. Anybody want to know where they're at? I think they're coming back from a place called Texas, we sent several kids and some of our responsible adults out there with our junior Bible quiz team to national state level competition. Now we gotta make a big to-do over them when they get back, but I wanted to share with you a little sneak peek about how they did, so I'm gonna share some stats with you. Three teams went from Oregon, and I'll let you know one of those teams is one of our neighbors, and that's from Medford at Bethel Assembly. They went to nationals. Parkway Christian Center went to nationals. And Portland Christian Center went to nationals representing the state of Oregon. Pretty exciting stuff. In that situation, the team that came in out of those three from our state, Bethel Assembly, came in 39th in the nation. They are competing. Pretty exciting stuff. Portland Christian Center came in 63rd in the nation competing. And this is some serious competition. And Parkway Christian Center, trailing behind them, came in 73rd in the nation. What's more exciting is I'm going to brag on one of our quizzers, Nicole Kemmer. 
Nicole Kemmer, there's her group over there all excited. She's been pretty quiet, and she's in ju junior Bible quiz, and she gives her good effort. But something sparked in her during this national competition. And one of the things that happens is if you answer seven questions during a 20-question match, they pull you out of the match because you're too good. Yeah. Happened to Nicole not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. Is it six questions? I'm sorry, six questions. Nicole quizzed out four times in her matches. That was pretty exciting stuff. So I wanted to share that with you. We are excited. So it looks like we're done with our offering. So Pastor Seth, you got the middle schoolers back there. Are you ready to take them with you? So all of our middle school students arise and exit the building. And then all of our elementary kids are all down here. We want to thank you so much for helping us be a part of BGMC. We're so excited to help with all of our missionaries around the world. We're getting ready to go over and have a great time in Kid Factory. We'll see you all a little bit later. Bye-bye. There's some serious cute factor going on there. All those little kids. I don't know whether I want to like load my wallet up with money or not put a lot in there because it's hard to say no to all those kids when they come up to you. But it's probably better to be generous than stingy, I'm thinking. Hey, we got, we got a few announcements for you today. So if you got your bulletin, you can follow along or you can just listen if you'd like to. First of all, um, group counseling that meets on Thursday at 6.30 in the fellowship hall, right down there. Everybody is welcome, and if you have not been coming, that's okay. You can get caught up to speed uh, very quickly. Um, and so the, the, the team that's leading that, their discussion topic for this month is creating positive relationships. So really want to encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. 6.30 in the fellowship hall. Um, also, don't forget tonight, tonight, um, Church of the Valley uh, is going to be gathering at River Valley for all prayer and worship night, and the theme for this is Humble Before the Lord. Six o'clock, prayer and worship just at River Valley, hanging out there with God to see what's going to happen, and, and really just to um, lay our lives before him, just to put our agendas aside, put our, our individual church's agendas aside, and just come together and say, God, we're your people. We're humbling ourselves before you. We just ask that you would use us. So um, that's happening tonight at 6 o'clock. Make sure you get your smartphone out, phone out right now. Put that in there. You probably want at least a 30-minute alarm on that so you're ready to go. If not, write it on your hand. Put it on your day timer. Uh, whatever you need to, to make sure that you're there. Um, baptism. We're having a baptism June 23rd. So that's just coming up here in a couple of weeks. And today there is going to be a class on water baptism. Now, one of the reasons we do a class is because sometimes there can be some confusion about what, about what water baptism is and what it represents. And we just want to kind of clear the air and look at Scripture and see what Scripture says that water baptism is and what it represents. And then also we kind of help you with some of the practical things to kind of help you help your mind be at ease when it comes to that day. And, and uh, we're excited about that coming up. And what I tell the, the folks that, that go through that class Man, water baptism is like spiritual adrenaline for the rest of us. I mean, when, when you're seeing people getting baptized and hearing their story, it's just like, whoo. I mean, it's, so that's happening. That's happening here June 23rd. We have, a, we have a few folks already signed up for that, ready to go. But if you have not signed up, you can just show up at the lunch today. Royal Family Kids Camp coming up here is in desperate need of some male counselors. So Allison is uh, our point person for that. So you can call Allison in the church office, if you've hung around here any time at all, you've heard about Royal Family Kids Camp. If you haven't, if you're fairly new and want to find out more about Royal Family Kids Camp, this camp that we do for kids in the foster care community, um, you can just call Allison, and she can tell you everything that you would like to know about this, this great ministry. So, so guys, especially, we need your help um, coming up for this, this camp that's going to be in, in July. Where are the Ruskas at? They usually sit over there. 50 years this Friday. Could you guys stand up so everybody knows who you are? 50 years. Congratulations on that. If you want to be mad at somebody for that, just talk to your daughter. So, so there you go. So congratulations. Congratulations. We, we appreciate your, uh, 
your sacrifice, Mrs. Ruska, <laughs> and all that you've done. <laughs> We just appreciate your, your guys' model of, of modeling marriage in front of us, and congratulations on, on 50 years. Well, hey, we are in the second week, and I guess final week, of the, the pulpit exchange, and we are just blessed and honored and privileged to have Pastor Mark Goins with us from River Valley Community Church. So let's give him a big, warm Parkway welcome. Wow. Nancy, what were you, four when you got married? <laughs> Amazing. Congratulations. Well, hey, it's a blessing to be here. I mean, it really is. I've been looking forward to uh, being here. I, I, this feels to me like a home away from home. Always coming into uh, the Parkway uh, house and... Uh, and, and there's such a special relationship that the churches have. I mean, I hope you realize the unique work of God in this community to bring churches together. And, and we really believe that we're one church, um, the church, the body of Christ, that just happens to meet in different places, you know, and, and have different names on our sign. But we're basically the body of Christ. And, and it's just so easy to take that for granted, even praying with the pastors, like your wonderful pastor, uh, Dennis, and, um, and to have a guy like that in my life as a mentor and as a friend, and, and the many times I'm over here in his office and we're praying together, we're talking about plans and ideas, and, and uh, just, just so appreciate his heart, um, and I, I know you guys realize how blessed you are. He taught at our church last week, and um, you know, inside the, the uh, folder that we have, like yours, there's a love offering envelope that we have for our benevolence ministry first, first Sunday of the month. Well, he gets up and he says, man, dang, I, I thought this was a love offering for me, you know? <laughs> so, like, no, no, no. He says, yeah, for needy kids, mine, is what he says. So I'm like, wait a minute, your kids are like old, you know? But um, I'll tell you, there's a real bond between the two of us. Some of you may, may remember this. Uh, when 9-11 occurred, uh, he and I, along with Pastor um, Bob Bonner, were down in Honduras. We were out of the country, and we were doing a pastor's conference there on unity down down there, and, uh, and, and I remember seeing, he and I were coming, we roomed together, and we came down and looked at this uh, squiggly television, black and white, and we can see what, the events, and it was just really kind of strange to see that and, and to be out of the country when that, and it, actually, we got stuck out of the country for a lot longer than we wanted to be, but it was uh, uh, a bonding experience uh, with him. So, uh, truly a privilege uh, to be here, and... Um, and I do feel there's a special relationship between River Valley and Parkway, you know? I feel like maybe someday we'll be one church, you know? Um, and, uh, and only God could do that. You think about our, <laughs> some of our, uh, you know, finer points of doctrine and whatnot that, that maybe don't matter all that much. Um, and so I, I am just grateful uh, uh, for this relationship, the special relationship uh, that we have. Um, and, you know, it's nice to teach one time this weekend, for me personally. <laughs> I, um, I think it's great. Uh, wish we had a larger building like you. And we, um, w one of my uh, staff guys, David Mathis, told me before I left, because I was at our service early this morning, first service, and he said to me, Mark, what are you going to do just one service? And he, he says, you're terrible the first time. <laughs> <laughs> like, thanks, bro. Appreciate that encouragement. That's exactly what I needed to, for this morning. <laughs> you got the gift of discouragement. <laughs> what I want to talk about today is going to require courage, courage to share it, courage to hear it. How many of you have learned that it really uh, nothing great happens for God without courage? I mean, you can read the Bible all day long, and that's good to read the Bible. You can come to church and hang out in church forever. But until we step out and, and we get courageous, there's going to be no great change that takes place. It reminds me of one of my favorite stories about courage. I shared this at CR a few weeks back, so I apologize if you heard this already. But one of my favorite stories on courage happened with this oil tycoon in Texas. You may have heard the story. He had this huge ranch, massive mansion and guest houses and 
and there's a big old golf course and, and multiple lakes, ski boats and toys on the lakes and all kinds of activity there on the ranch, a working ranch, horses and cattle. And, and this tycoon had a party and invited uh, his employees and, and friends to this big party. Well, in the middle of the party, he called everybody to where he was and he quieted the crowd and, and he said, thanks so much for honoring me by being here today at this this party that I'm holding, and I want you to know that it's courage that's made me the man that I am today. Courage. In fact, I, I value courage so much that I have a proposal to, to see if anybody here is courageous enough to take me up on it. And he pointed over to a smaller lake that was filled with alligators. <laughs> and he said, see this little lake over here with the alligators? The person who has the courage to swim across that lake and make it to the other side. I will give you this whole ranch, all of it, today. And, and, and if, if you would rather, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my uh, ski resort, private ski resort in Colorado. But if that's not appealing, I'll give you my private Caribbean island. Your choice. Does anybody here have the courage? Well, they, you know, kind of like you, they laughed and like, what idiot's going to swim across that lake, long silence, and then splash. In a guy goes, and he's just jamming across this little lake. And the people are just horrified. They're stunned and, and amazed at what he's doing. And even the alligators are, are caught off guard as he's bouncing <laughs> off of them. And they're snapping, and they're just missing him. And he, you know, by a miracle, he makes it across to the other side, jumps out, and he's, uh, you know, catching his breath, out of breath, dripping wet, and the people all go running over there. The oil tycoon in his golf cart goes riding over there, and they're all slapping him on the back and congratulating him, and great job, that was awesome. Which one are you going to choose? And they're all, and he's just like, ah, ah, like this. and the oil tycoon says, and I'm a man of my word. Which one do you want? You want the ranch? You want the private Caribbean island? You want the ski resort? And they got, uh, all I want is one thing, the name of the man who pushed me in. <laughs> Any of you ever feel like you got pushed in? You know, there's so often, like someone might come to me and say, hey, Mark, I appreciate your courage, appreciate, you know, what's, what you did or this or that or whatever. And the truth of the matter is, I just got pushed in by somebody. I mean, every time I get up to teach, I feel like I got pushed in. It's like, what am I doing here? It's like, really? You know? And perhaps you feel that way too. And I think that, that as I look back and I, I evaluate, you know, <laughs> kind of the mess of my life and, and it's all by God's grace, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, having any contribution for him, uh, it's because he pushed me in. God's pretty good at that. Because he died not just, Jesus died not just to save us and to take us to heaven one day, but that we would live a life of adventure and risk. How many of you have learned that with very little risk comes very little reward? And high risk means high reward. So here's what we need to talk about today. You know, when we get into God's work, it could be dangerous. Like, there's alligators out there. It's been said that ministry is great. It's just the people that are mean. <laughs> you get snapped at, and, and it could be tough. And so what we need to see is, is, let's just be honest here, our natural tendency is to default towards comfort and to let fear drive our lives. We make decisions based on you know, how comfortable, how easy can it be? And this can translate into our Christian lives as well. And sometimes we'll throw spiritual terms on it. We'll even use terms in the Bible to sort of justify our complacency. And we start, what happens is we start to water down certain words and themes in the Bible more to our level than rising up by God's grace to the true definition of that word or theme. Let me give you one example of that. It's this word that's the most common word for, for us as a group. And, and we're known primarily, among other things, as the church, right? We're the church. 
And so there's a tendency, what I want to talk about is to sort of define church more in terms of what makes us comfortable, I'll just speak to myself, what I like best, than what God really had in mind. So we want to talk about what's the church and what's it for. Okay, what's the church and what's it for? Now, for most people, as they drive past today, as Dennis says, they, they don't come today on purpose. Church is a building. I mean, you have a beautiful facility here. That's, that's the church, right? Others who are a little sharper would know that the church is, you know, they, would, they might say, well, it's, it's a service. What's going on inside? Right? And, and others who maybe understand a little bit more would say, no, no, it's the people, and they, they, they're a religious group, and they have a church in their name. Well, Parkway doesn't, but you know what? You guys are still a church, right? You're a Christian center, but it's just a way to hide the name church. But anyway. <laughs> now, for those who really know their Bible, know that, that the church, like if you know the Greek word for church, it's the word ekklesia. And ekklesia uh, simply means the called out ones. And so for years, I was taught that, and, and accurately so, that the church is this group that's been called out of the world, called to be separate, and the special group of people that belong to God. True? Absolutely true. But what we tend to do is we'll take a good definition like that, and then we'll start adding things to it, if not verbally, at least in our mind. And we start to actually look more like fortress mentality. Holy huddle. Us four, no more, shut the door type thing. And it's safe, and it's really, you know, God's here, but I'm not sure he's out there. And, you know, we're kind of the good people, and they're not. And, you know, there's different ways of looking at it, sort of like, you know, us versus them. And so what we need to talk about today is this big idea that every Christian should understand and live the true definition of the church, and what's going to be required of us today is to see some things differently. And some of you, you're maybe right here, and I'm not going to teach you anything that you don't already know and are living right now, praise God. And others of you maybe just need a little bit of adjustment, and others, if you're like me, you need more radical adjustment based on where you're presently at in terms of how to view uh, this thing. And so there's three fundamental shifts that need to take place. First is to see the church differently to see the church accurately. So let's get back to this word ecclesia, called out group. Like, like, where did it come from? Where do we get the word in the first place? What does Jesus mean when he used it? What did Paul mean? What did Luke, who wrote the history of the church in the book of Acts, what did he mean when he used this term church? I mean, it's not originally a Christian word. It was a word that already existed in the Greek language. And Jesus takes it and says, that'll do. That will do, that, that will describe what I desire for my people. Paul used, of course, Luke used it, the other New Testament writers uh, use it. And what this word, ecclesia, meant is it described a certain group of people in the ancient world. See, if you grew up and lived in ancient Eastern culture, a man would spend a lot of his time in a trade, blacksmith, farmer, uh, you know, tent maker, tanner, not tanning salon, uh, <laughs> okay, you know, leather making, uh, but whatever the trade was, and, and he would mentor his son. And at a certain age, say he was like 40, 50-ish, would then uh, call his son in and give him his, his tools and say, you know, it's yours now. But if you need some help, I'm here. If you get real busy, I'll step in. But you're the man. This is, this is, your, uh, this is yours now. And what this uh, father would do is he would go down to the city gate. If it was a wealthy city, a nice elaborate gate. If it was a village, it was just a hole in the fence. And they would sit with other men, same stage of life, there at the city or village gate. And they would sit around and talk. You say, well, about what? Well, not just about, like, you know, my story's better than your story, my joke's better than your joke, my golf game's better than your golf game, or RV's bigger than your, whatever. They, they would actually talk about how to benefit the community. Like, like, what can we actually come up with that will help this place be a better place 
to live. And, and they would be a go-to group. So like if there were problems, maybe Philip and Joseph couldn't get along, and so they would send them to this group. And so they would sort of mediate, and, and so they would settle disputes and ethical dilemmas and challenges in uh, the community. And so this was a respected group. This was a group of people that added tremendous value because of their role and their presence. Now, there's a subtle illustration of this in Luke chapter 12. In Luke 12, a man comes to Jesus and he says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus' answer is very interesting. He says, man, who made me judge or arbiter over you? Ever thought that's a strange response? You could do a little better than that, Jesus. He says, man, who made me judge over you guys? In other words, I'm just a visitor here in this community. I don't sit at your city gate. Those are the guys, you know. You should be talking to those guys. And then Jesus tells this story about the man who had a very successful bumper crop, and he was so blessed, he said, man, what am I going to do with all this wealth? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns so I can take it easy, eat, drink, you know, self, self, self is basically what he was thinking. And Jesus just lays the smack down on the guy in the story, and he basically says, you fool. By the way, it's never good when Jesus says, you fool. <laughs> this very night, your life will be demanded from you. So we typically use this teaching to warn against the dangers of greed, materialism, hoarding, right? And, and that's a good way to teach this. But something that gets missed, another big idea here, every listener would have known that Jesus is coming down on this guy because he didn't go get advice. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll take it easy. That he didn't go talk to these guys and walk in humility. I mean, it, it, may, it may have looked like this. This guy has this dilemma. He comes up to the, to the elders in a, in a very respectful, honoring uh, demeanor, and he says, fathers of mine. Maybe he would have squatted down. Fathers of mine, I, I've had a bumper crop, and I, I, it's a good problem, but I am so blessed. I'm thinking of building a bigger barn for it all. What do you think? And... One guy might have said, oh, slow down, Sonny, let's, let's talk about this. And, and then another, another guy might have said, well, have you thought about the poor? You know, there's a lot of poor in this community. And the guy's like, yeah, that's, that's a good point, the poor. And then another may have said, well, what about the, 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 the temple, the priest? Have you thought about, you know, giving to the priest? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good idea also. And then one more guy may have said, have you thought about sharing your, your prosperity with the village? I mean, letting them in on the blessing as well. He's like, yeah. Let me write this down. Number one, the poor. Number two, the priest. Number three, the party. Yeah. And, and those are great ideas. That, that's where my priority should be. And, and then maybe another man would have said, and if you focus on those things first, go, go build a bigger barn. You know, I, we're just speculating, okay? But I mean, this is what we're talking about, that, that this guy showed arrogance, self-reliance, and not humbling himself with these uh, men at the city gate. Now, all that to say, and you know where I'm going with this, this group that existed to make the city a better place was called Ecclesia. This was the church. This is where that name comes from. It's a better village, it's a better city, it's a better community because of this group. If they get pulled out, if they quit and, and go away, it's terrible to think of what would happen because this group isn't there anymore. And so what is the church? Think about it now in terms of the churches together and Parkway. What is the church? Well, more accurately, it's the called out group of saved ones sent to participate in the work of Jesus in this world. The Latin term would be participatio Christi. We're participating with Christ, that we're the called out group, but not just to hunker down, to play it safe, and to enjoy our services as, as, as a church, okay, but it's to participate with Christ and in his work. And so is this community a better place because we're here? How would this community miss us if we were gone? Now, don't just think of that on a global level, uh, 
all church level, which is appropriate to, to look at that way, but think of it as Parkway, like if Parkway was just removed, like how would this community suffer? And how, about, how about your family? Like if your, if your family was ripped out, how would this community feel about that? Or you, I mean, they may, they, they, they may not like your God at all. They may totally disagree with your theology, but how would they feel if, you know, what would they go, what are we gonna do without them? I take a minute just to brag on my kids. Parents are allowed to do that, right? You know, it's, it feels always kind of weird, though, because my kids are human, and they come, you know, they, they make all kinds of, you know, crazy mistakes and stuff, but, but they all four love Jesus, and, and when they, um, they're, they're in college now. Actually, our oldest, Tyler, just graduated from college, but they were all four at North Valley at the same time. You're like, how is that possible? Well, we have twin girls in the middle, Okay. Uh, Cody, Natalie, Nicole, and then Tyler. So they were all four, ninth grade, junior, junior, and then senior at North Valley. Well, after Tyler had graduated, and, and, and I think, I don't remember exactly the time frame on this, but um, I was really thankful, so blessed, that even with their struggles and ups and downs, they followed Jesus like all the way through high school. I mean, really served the Lord in a tough place, tough, tough place, seriously. Well, it got back to me that someone in the office, I think this is when my girls were, were like seniors, that someone in the office overheard someone else say, what are we going to do around here when the Goins kids are gone? And man, that was just, so, I mean, I, I'm like, God, you can just take me right now, <laughs> knowing, that, knowing that, 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 that my kids are living in such a way that they're wondering, and there's just, just four of them. At that time, just three of them left. But I mean, to, like, to, to say, this is going to be a struggle when they're gone. I mean, think about that where you work. I mean, think about that, you know, in your neighborhood. Would people, like, applaud? He's gone, or whatever. Or would it be like, <laughs> would it be like oh, man, how are we going to replace How are we gonna replace them? <clears throat> Proverbs 11, 24 through 26, one man gives freely yet, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. People, and this is interesting, this verse gets missed. People curse the man who hoards grain, but blessing crowns him who's willing to sell. Now here's what's strange about that verse. We tend to look at this in terms of giving, like be generous and give. But verse 26 talks about our work, the one who's willing to sell. So a way to be generous is our contribution on the job. What kind of product do we put out? What kind of customer service do we have? Do we live in such a way that it's a gift to the, I mean, we, we can so easily see it as a nine to five or punching a clock. It's just a drag. But every single job in this community is a way, as we read in Titus 2.10, to live in such a way, especially on the job, that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Wow. That people, like, look at you and me, and they, 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 they see us in real life, and it's going to be good, and it's not going to be good some days, but there's a general rule of life. We're trying to follow Jesus, and, and they're saying, you know what? There's something about their life that's attractive, and man, that's just so often not the case. In my, like last night after church, I was driving. I, I have a motorcycle. It's basically a dirt bike with a license plate on it. <laughs> and so I was on G Street, starved, wanting to get home to eat. And right there at Pine, I think it is, this is a really weird intersection. There's all kinds of weird things going on right there. These two cars stopped waiting for cars coming to, to town to turn. Well, I thought just for a second about passing on the right, which you're not supposed to do. So I started it and then stopped, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so I stopped there. So I'm kind of to the right of this second car. And behind me, this truck lays on its horn because he wanted to do the same thing. Now he couldn't. I'd blocked his goals, okay? He wanted to pass on the right. Laying on the horn, I turn around, give me the bird and everything. I mean, it's a true road rage kind of a deal. So Pastor Mark kicked in, in all of his spirituality. And I started, once the, once the car started to go, I started to kind of idle. And I turned around, I just pointed at him, okay? And I'm just driving like this, and I'm just pointing at him. <laughs> you think that caused him to back off? You know, it never works, okay? Mistake number one. 
Mistake number one, respond to his anger, you know, because this is what men have to do, right? You got to like stand up for yourself and point at the guy, and I'm kind of doing this as I'm driving, you know, and, and so I start, I start driving, and out of the corner of my eye, I see him trying to pass me, like on G Street, okay? He's passing me. So if I was humble and in the spirit-filled state that like Dennis would have been, <laughs> I just would have said, knock yourself out, just go for it. Well, once I saw him here, I hit it hard. <laughs> and there's no way he's got more acceleration than me. So we're jamming down G Street, okay? And then he realized that, that he's going to lose this, this part of it, and so he gets in behind me. So now, now I've got this little mirror that just allows me to pass the DMV, and it's like about this big, but it's completely worthless. And I look in that thing, and I'm trying to, you know, where is he? And all I see is this white bumper front of this truck and I'm like oh my goodness now and all the way out to the end of G Street now we're on Upper River Road and I'm like all right I guess I just better get some distance between us you know because now I'm in this thing now I'm such a knucklehead I'm in it so I just I just jump on it and I create some cushion <laughs> to put it that way well I got these knobbies on this thing and they're not very great at cornering you know so you just got to be careful so I'm having to slow down the curve but I, I, I lost the guy I'm like and I'm like man that was really stupid Mark and uh, I look in that rearview mirror, there he is again. I mean, it's just like out of a movie. <laughs> a nightmare. And now we're on Up River Road, and we're just going out, and I'm like, okay, I don't have any good options right now. Like, <laughs> I can go home, then he's going to know where, I'm, where I live. I can, like, continue to drive like a madman, end up in a ditch, right? And I'm thinking to myself, like, he's a lot bigger than me. Why am I doing this with a truck? Why am I doing this anyway? This is stupid. But I mean, I mean, it's like, and so and then the, I guess what I could do is I could pull over. And, but there's two guys in the truck. How smart is that? <laughs> That's the decision that I made. And fortunately, the game was over and he took off. But I just got to share with you, you got to pray for guys like me, all right? Because I, I mean, I don't always get it right. I was not making the gospel attractive with that. Now you could say, well, he started it. He was an idiot. But you know what? I was an idiot. And I haven't told my wife that story yet, so please don't tell her, okay? <laughs> She's not going to be happy at all. She's going to hide the motorcycle keys. All right. I wasn't going to tell that story, but uh, I don't have to be here next week, so. Uh. <laughs> Acts chapter 11, verse 27 through 30, it says, During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Now this is very interesting what's happening here. You've got this famine that's coming. And, and, and so Antioch, which is hundreds of miles from Jerusalem, what do they do? They take an offering for themselves? No. To send to Jerusalem. Again, that's what we're talking about. I mean, that's like I heard, I heard about um, in Indonesia where there's heavy persecution of Christians because of the Islamic um, fundamental movement there and churches getting burned and Christians getting killed. But um, there are, the man who works there with believers, encouraging believers, told me that many Christians who are very poor is they're taking some of the money that they would use on their own food and they're buying food and giving it to their Muslim neighbors. And many of those neighbors are coming to Jesus. So I mean, that's what we're talking about. It's like getting out of ourselves, whether it be road rage, whether it be our food, getting out of ourselves and submitting to Christ and letting him use us, which is our main goal, that we would add value to the city, peace and love, to schools, to neighborhoods, to jobs. Matthew 5, this is really kind of the theme verse of Serve GP. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Because, you know, I hate to break this to you and me, but the people out there don't really care what's going on in here. They don't know. They don't really care. 
That's why we have to be out there. That's why the church has to be outward. That participating with Jesus in the community is the better definition. Yeah, we gather. It's a great time here, but, but it's a church out there. And as we think about the reason for our existence, we're like a city on a hill. I love this term, a city on a hill. You can't miss it. You're out in the desert. You see the city, you know. And what is a city on a hill? It's a collection of lights, right? The more lights, the brighter. This is why, and I know Jason shared this with you earlier, and, and, and Danny last week, and, and you'll hear, um, you're like, Let's get, let's get Dennis back, please. You know, but next week, Dennis, he's just going to say, you know what, you have to sign up. It's just the way he is, right? You have to sign up. And, and it's not just like this authority power trip, legalism. It's because we need your light. We need your light. Even if you're still at home, you, you can't work, you're at home on a prayer team praying for us. We need that light to shine brighter. So, you know, when it comes to why River Valley and why Parkway and why we exist, you know, it's so easy to, to look at, at things and, and the scorecard is, is, is good things, but maybe we we're missing a little bit. Like we might say it's, it's the teaching and, 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 and arguably you guys have the finest here with, with Dennis. And, and, and some might say it's, it's music and worship and, and you guys, again, arguably the finest here. And, and and, and some might say, well, look, it's the facility, and there's no argument. It's definitely the finest. You guys get the best facility. I'm jealous all the time of your facility, and it's just awesome. And some might say, well, you know, it's the kids and programs, and you guys have it going on. You have it going on here. But let's remember that that's not really the scorecard. The true scorecard is, is it outward? Is it participating with Christ in the community? That's what we're talking about. Now, number two, and we'll move a much quicker on the last two is we have to see God differently. That God is not just in some big heaven out there, too holy to involve himself uh, in the mess and in the sin of this world. All throughout the Bible, after the fall of Adam and Eve, you have a God that doesn't stay separate, but you have a God who uh, moves outward and propels himself into the lives and the mess of uh, the world. I mean, I don't know if you ever thought of it this way, but from the very beginning, you have God the missionary. God the missionary. And and he goes out, and he is chasing after, not in a desperate way, but in a loving way, people that hate him, people that that don't want anything to do with him. Uh, He pursues, God the missionary goes out. I mean, God the Father sends God the Son. God the Son and God the Father, send the Holy Spirit. But then it's not complete until we realize we're sent by God. We are the body of Christ. The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, symbolizing that the the presence of God is now in you and me, individually and then collectively as the body of Christ. That's why we can't have this temple God philosophy. That's old covenant. In fact, even back then, God said, that's not really what I'm about. I'm not about living in a temple made by hands. Even when it was true that that's where the Shekinah glory dwelt. So like today especially, he's like, man, I'm just as much out there as I am in here. You ever thought of it that way? I think sometimes we think, well, this is really where God is. And yeah, this is. But I mean, I think he's... I think he's across the street in Fred Meyer. I, I, think, I think he's on the school campus. I think he's, he is out there. And, and again, this is all based on his character. Theologians call this the Missio Dei. And, and this has been translated the mission of God, which is not accurate. That's not what it means. What the Missio Dei really means is that it's the missioning God or the God of mission. In other words, this is part of God's character. God is a God who is on mission. You can't understand God unless you see him through this paradigm. That this is is God's heart. That Jesus is wanting uh, to destroy the, the dreadful power of religiosity and to get us living out where he is. I mean, you think about Jesus, you think about his heart. He says, I'm not with the healthy, I'm with the sick. What's that, Luke 5? I want to call sinners to repentance. That's the heart of our God, working with him. 
participating where he is out there. And then third, we have to see the world differently. And the Latin for this is imago Dei, which means image of God. And when we see people, I think it's important, I think it's easy to forget this because of what a mess fallen, sinful humanity is uh, in. It's easy to miss that every person is created in the image of God. Every person bears the image of God. It's like everyone has God's, I don't know, maybe, I hope I'm not pushing it here theologically, but it's like every person has the fingerprints of God on their soul. Doesn't mean they're Christians. Sinful, yes. Fallen, yes. But they, they have this image of God. And, and that's why Romans 1 and 2 says that everybody has a God awareness. I, I mean, I don't really believe there's an honest atheist out there. Because God has given to the, the human soul conscience and an awareness of right and wrong, the law of God on, on the heart. Again, doesn't make a person a Christian. It just makes people God aware. That's why 95% of Americans believe in God. They're all Christians. I wish. They're not, but they believe in God. Now, all this to say that we need to approach, like, Mark, where are you going with this? We should approach people a little differently in our mentality that we have a starting point for conversation, that most people that you interact with out there believe in some kind of God. Could be all whacked, messed up, nutcase kind of a view, but, but it's a view of, it's a starting point for discussion. So go with that. Rather than, oh, they don't want to talk about this, they don't want anything to do with this, go with that. That's what Paul did. That's many examples we see in the, in, the, in the New Testament where they started with where people were at and then brought a completion to their theology and who Jesus is and, and why they need him so desperately. So the whole point is that we, we see people created in God's image and we start conversations and see people as very valuable. People are different than like an animal, you know, or like a plant. I mean, people are created in God's image. They have incredible incredible deep value in God's eyes. Why? I don't know, but it's true. So we see people the way God sees them, or at least try, whether it's, again, somebody on your bumper (laughs) honking at you, you know, or a difficult person to love at, at work, you know, but we see people for how God sees them. Matthew 9, 20, or 35 through 38 Uh, I think we have that scripture. There it is. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Get the heart of Jesus here. God, help me with this. Please help Mark Gollins with this to get your heart that it's not anger and disgust. It's compassion. Sees people without a shepherd, harassed and helpless. And to see people through those lenses. Because if you consider the motivation that Jesus gives us to be doing risky things, to be out there where he is, and to see churches way beyond this facility. Because then the whole point is, this is for Jesus. Isn't that cool? It's like, this is for Jesus. More than anything else, it's for him. And not only that, this is as Jesus. Like, like he's, he's not just saying, go do this. He's saying, let's go. Like, he's in you and me. I mean, like, If that's not motivating enough, we do it for Jesus, we do it as Jesus, and then we read in Matthew 25, Jesus says, when you do this, you do it to me. I mean, how much more motivation do we need? It's like we do this for Jesus, we do this as Jesus, and we actually do this to Jesus? That's amazing. So participating with Christ, with with a God who's out there, who's put his image on the soul of every person because of his great love and care for them. And I want to conclude with a little video that tells a story, a couple of minutes, 
called the life-saving station. And I think it's a, it's a powerful parable that, that your church, our church, probably every church should look at at least once a month. Check out here the life-saving station and apply this to our uh, Christian church experience. On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was no more than a hut, and there was only one boat. But the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. With little to no thought for themselves, they went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station and give their time and money in an effort to support the work. New boats were brought in and new crews were trained. And the little life-saving station grew. Some of these new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those who were saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they began to use it sort of as a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in this club's decor, and there was a memorial lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and some of them were foreigners. The beautiful new club was in chaos immediately. The property committee hired someone to rig up a shower outside the club, where victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. The outsiders made the life-saving station extremely dirty. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities because they felt that they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. But a small number of members insisted upon life-saving as their primary mission and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. After all, the dissenting group's members were voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So they did. As the years went by, however, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was found. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that eastern seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters. But most of the passengers drown. Let's pray. Father, you know our tendency to live as people of the flesh that depend on ourselves and go after comfort and even in the church to live more like a club. Lord, to whatever degree that rings true as we search our hearts, Lord, we lay our hearts before you and Holy Spirit, we ask you to to speak to us and convict us and challenge us and rebuke and correct the defective perspective we have right now about what our lives are about and what this church is about, God. Lord, we thank you for what an outward missionary God you are. We thank you for your great love for us, but not just us, this community and each individual. And so, Lord, help each of us, uh, as we take this and apply it in a serious way, not just for serve GP as we covet and, and, and ask and pray for great participation for your glory, but Lord, every day as um, very outward, Holy Spirit-filled uh, people, Lord, uh, because without you, we can do nothing. So we, we lay ourselves again and thank you, Lord, with all of our flaws, struggles, sins, knowing that, that if we just live a life of repentance, coming before you, uh, asking you to fill us back up, um, getting back up, that uh, there's 
ample grace to be found in you. And we praise you for that. You are our only hope. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Lord, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you as the Savior, that today they'd be born again, that they would talk to somebody about how to uh, make sure their sins are forgiven and that they could, they could know uh, that, that they have eternal life with you uh, in heaven. So, God, we thank you. What a wonderful uh, church this, this is. We, uh, we continue to, uh, I just pray for Parkway and for their leadership and for just continued uh, blessing and, and uh, fruit and impact uh, for your glory. Continued miracles, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure to be with you and teach you today. Thanks, Pastor Mark. Thanks for that challenge. I think we've all been, all been challenged and reminded, hopefully, who we are and who we are to be. So we come to the part of our service where we need to begin to do something about what we've just heard. So in your bulletin, you have actually two cards today. One's a blue card. One is actually a white card. Let's take both of those out, and every week we do our blue cards. Um, it's interesting, they've, they've kind of become known as the blue cards, although they're really the next step card. On Mother's Day, we did pink cards, so that kind of threw us a curve there. But um, our next step, what's our next step? So first of all, I would like to commit my life to Christ and be baptized in water on Sunday, June 23rd. If that's you, you're like, you know what, I, I need to be saved. I've been lost. i have one of those people that was in a shipwreck, and... My life is upside down. I've tried to do it my own way for, for so long, and, and I'm done doing it my way. I'm turning my life over to Christ. We've got lunch for you, and we're going to talk more about what that means to turn your life over to Christ along with water baptism. So you can just meet us down in the fellowship hall um, right down there, but go ahead and, and check that box as well. Also, the, the other boxes, um, uh, they're around uh, Serve Grants Pass. I will pray for Serve Grants Pass. I will sign up and volunteer for Serve Grants Pass, or our care group will, will sign up and, and serve Grants Pass. You know, and sometimes we look at that and we try to find the most convenient one, which one works, and we want to do that. Obviously, we want to find one that's going to be going to work for everybody's schedule, but the reality is sometimes we just base it solely on convenience, don't we? Like, oh, this one's the easiest, this one's the quickest, this one's, you know what, maybe the easiest, quickest one isn't the one you're to volunteer for. Maybe that one that the Holy Spirit's leading you to, and the reality of may, maybe it shouldn't be just super easy and convenient in our lives. We need to get out there and we need to, we need to serve. We need to maybe sacrifice a little bit, roll up the, roll up the sleeves. So we encourage you to, to check one of those boxes, a place on the back of that card as well for prayer requests and answered prayers. And we do pray for those. Um, and if any of your family information has changed, please, uh, please let us know about that. Also, you have this, this white one, the Serve GP, Serve Grants Pass. And... Um, there's a couple things you can do with this. First of all, if you've if you got a smartphone or know how to scan that little code there with the optical uh, digital scanner, you can do that. It'll take you right to the website, or you can go to servegp.org, and, um, and you can sign up there real easy. Um, our, our care group, that's how, that's how we took care of it. Um, so it's, it's pretty, uh, sorry, servegp.com. Actually, I think .org works as, as well. But servegp.com is the official one here. So... Um, you can go online and sign up your group or sign up as an individual. It will tell you um, when and where there's opportunities to serve. Or if you'd like, you can just fill this out, put it in the offering, and then in the office, we'll go on servegp.com and go ahead and get that, get that filled out for you. So that's what, uh, that's what uh, both of those inserts are for. We just we want to get out there. We want to be, be the church, not just talk about being the church and not just come to church. That's scripturally not even possible to come to church unless there's two or three other Christians there. So we want to go out and, uh, and be the church. So be sure to sign up for Serve Grants Pass today. I'm going to ask the ushers to come and help serve us through our, our regular giving and tithes and offerings and also a chance to turn in your blue and or white uh, card there. And while they're doing that, we've got a video on Serve Grants Pass.
There you go. There you go. Um, I just want to highlight one of the areas that we haven't talked about a ton, and that's the prayer side of things. You may not physically, especially be able to get out and, and work for half a day or a day or a week or, or whatever your uh, specific job is. We need you to pray. And we don't need you to pray just because, well, you can't do anything else. We need you to pray because we need this base, this foundation of prayer um, there established. So if you're not able to get out um, or even if you just feel drawn that, that you, need to be, you need to be praying, we would really encourage you to, to check that box, get online, register, let people know, hey, we're going to be praying for those that are out there. We're going to be praying that the light, the light would shine. Well, it looks like our guys and gals have done a great job uh, picking up everything that needs to be picked up and going to ask them to go ahead and bring that down front. Pastor Mark, you were sharing the story about the, your motorcycle and stuff, and you were talking about Keith and Nancy. You could have just, like, zipped into their house real quick. I think they live out there. And Wait, you have a white truck, don't you, Keith? Don't you have a white? Hmm. Okay. We'll let you guys work that out later on. But seriously, Serve Grants Pass, what a great opportunity. Our group has, has taken part of it, and I know many of you have as well. And uh, we're just excited that we get to go serve our community and that the, the, the community is getting more and more excited about us coming to serve. They're asking for us. They're like, hey, let's get those Christians. Let's get them out here to serve. And, and we're going to go just, just be light in a dark place. And I'm going to ask our, our elders and, and spouses that are available, pastors as well that are here, if they would come forward. And let's just pray. Let's just... Um, bathe this entire thing in prayer. So those of you that are here in service with us today, so you would come up and join us and join us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your challenge this morning from your word, God, that we are to be your church, God. And Lord, I pray that that it would happen the way you want it to. And Lord, that it would point directly to you, to a loving, powerful, willing that none should perish God. And Lord, I pray that, that Lord, some of us might look and say, well, we don't have the strength, we don't have, God, that we wouldn't lean on our own understanding, but God, that we would just show up and serve the best we can with a smile on our face and loving those around us, God, for your glory. Lord, and we thank you for this opportunity that we have, Lord. We don't take this for granted, God. We thank you, God, for, the, for the, those that have in the past gone before and worked hard and, and, and uh, been a light in this community so that we can be an even brighter light, we pray, God. And for those that come down the road, God, that they would continue to be a brighter and brighter light of the goodness of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just pray right now for those, God, that will be looking on this light. Lord, I thank you that they do have the fingerprints of God on their heart, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to engage in conversation, Lord, and, and with them that just points directly to you, God. We thank you for this time. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.